Hey kids, are you tired of the same old, same old? Hot Wheels, Micro Machines, barely exciting. Easy Bake Oven, more like crappy cupcakes cooked on a light bulb. Turd Pies is what they are. Transformers, more like Transformers. G.I. Joe, Discharge for Terminal Narcolepsy. You need something for the modern kid. It's not the 80s anymore. This child's entertainment of the past is worthless. We know what you want, kid. What you want is something extreme. And what's extreme? Bringing down the wall in East Berlin? DIY Home Depot crap. Competing in the X Games? Skateboards are for cowards without rocket-powered speedboats. Fist fight a tiger in a Bangalore whorehouse? Well, that's child's play. No, kids. This is the 90s. This is extreme. This is... Get upset on the internet. Yo, what's up and welcome to the Retro Station 1989. My name's Commander Dan. I'm the commander and lone human inhabitant of the Retro Station. And this is Licensed to Play. It's a show where we evaluate licensed video games. You know, things like based on comic books, movies, TV shows, breakfast cereals, hell, fast food. If it was licensed and it had a retro game, we evaluate it to see if it's got a license to play. And this week, all you 90s hooligans and troublemakers are going to go nostalgia crazy. Or be exposed for the very first time to one of the licenses I couldn't wait to share with you. This is one I was most hyped for, as my childhood kind of came to an end in the early 90s. Uh, you may have noticed we've modified the holographic interior of the retro station to bring you all back to the roaring 90s. The land of extreme! That's right, the beginning of the end for the unique nature of Saturday morning cartoons. I mean, well, Cambot, hit it. Picture, if you will, the world as it was, cooling from the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. Huey Lewis and the news were still relevant. Skinny ties were going out of style. And Hammer's pants were crab-walking their asses into all of our hearts. And in this time was the final death throes of Saturday mornings, when Saturday morning cartoons took off. Right in the late 70s and early 80s, you'd see crazy shit. Robonic Stooges, time-traveling Fonzies, Laverne and Shirley in the army and some shit, and whatever the racist hell this bullshit is. Actually, I ain't gonna pretend. That is Rickety Rocket. Some dude, a white dude for sure, honky Harrison III maybe, decided that our black brothers and sisters wanted to be shown that even in the far-flung future, black folks live in a junkyard with a racist-ass spaceship. But things got better. MC Hammer got his own cartoon, with zero racist spaceships. The 70s and 80s gave us Saturday morning as the time for kids' programming. Wuzzles, Smurfs, Flintstone Kids, scuba dooba doo and so many more. Arcade games got cartoons. Education got cartoons. And after G.I. Joe and Transformers made the move to afternoons and learned how to monetize children like a beautiful animated Fagin... The 90s introduced new channels and Saturday blocks of children's shows on Fox TV. And this was the dawn of Fox Kids. Beginning in 1992, Fox Children's Department decided to do the opposite of everything every other channel was doing. CBS had the WB Looney Tunes classics and 80s stuff, proving that even back then they were the boomer network, even in 1992. And ABC featured the Hanna-Barbera properties, prior to the Disney collective absorbing them until all are one. And NBC featured the Disney Saturday properties that would later be moved to the Disney afternoon. So Fox probably sat down and was like, first, Peter Pan and the Pirates. Now I've talked about the game, which should live on in a herpes blister infested hell tucked between a zombie's rectal cleft because of badness. But the cartoon was awesome. Second, screw Mickey Mouse. We'll base cartoons on stand-up comics who kids won't know. Bobby's World. Camp Diabetes. I mean, Life with Louie. Rosie O'Donnell had a cartoon, for God's sake. And then Fox did something I couldn't believe. It resurrected Beetlejuice from ABC being canceled to Back to Life. And third, B-movies. Horror movies. We're going to make a cartoon about Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Little Shop of Horrors. And Little Dracula which is a take on the Count Floyd character from SCTV. Fox Kids said, Kids are extreme now, and they are going to love ex 
extremely obscure shit. You know it! Extreme tunes, extreme gear, extreme everything! Yeah! Snacks were extreme. Corn blasted, taco Commander shredded, Dan? sour tart, extreme! Commander Dan, this has to stop. The 90s were nearly half a century ago, and that era's extreme nature could throw the station out of balance. Okay. And the point of all this, really? Fox tried to be extreme, and where Nickelodeon had one of the greatest subversive comedic cartoons of all time, Ren and Stimpy, Fox took a shot and hired one of my most beloved creative influences in life, and heroes. Well, more like they summoned him from the Stygian abyss of pre-production hell, because try as hard as this guy might, he couldn't get a movie created in the 90s. And I mean, you know, why not have him creating subversive tunes for Fox? Let's go ahead and talk about one of my heroes, Savage Steve Holland. Roll it, Cambot Jr. Whatever, Commander Douche. Whoa! Nice tood, CB! Thanks, boss. Rolling! All right, Space Pirates, this is Savage Steve Holland. Film director, animator, and children's show maven on Disney Channel and Nickelodeon to this day. This dude in the 80s made movies you may have caught on HBO or Cinemax or Stars in the middle of the night. Long ago, in the days before streaming, he made comedies about teens, which were hilarious, dark, weird, and goofy. But his sense of humor, if you'll pardon the pun, was too extreme to fit in with 80s kids' movies like The Goonies and Explorers and Breakfast Club, and not filthy enough to fit in with teen sex comedies like Porky's and The Last American Virgin and Revenge of the Nerds. Steve Holland was a man without a country in the 80s because he was so unique. The 80s, they just weren't ready for the extreme sense of humor of savage Steve Holland. For example, Better Off Dead, the story of skier Lane Myers and his status-climbing ex-girlfriend, and his attempts to kill himself out of depression. The New York Times, snob rag of the 80s movie scene, didn't get it. They called it mildly amusing, and buddy, they're off base by a million miles there. Lane blows up his neighbor's mom, is pursued by a demonic paperboy, and falls in love with one of my childhood crushes, Diane Franklin. This flick is a cult classic and features Curtis Armstrong in one of the best dirtbag best friend character portrayals on film, period. It's a great flick with a happy ending, but John Cusack comes right back, folks. Steve Holland directed One Crazy Summer which introduced the world to Bobcat Goldthwait on a major stage. And damn, if it isn't a Save the Children's Center type shenanigans-based comedy, but it's full of charm, hilarity, and fun that ends with a big-ass boat race. I mean, right? Isn't that the 80s right there? It has great slapstick, wry humor, and again, a mean streak that's just missing from the modern teen and children's fair out there. Steve Holland had a brand. Surreal, dark, funny, smart, and mean. And he loved animation and illustration, which is where my love of his movies comes from, really. Check out these sequences, and I think you'll get what I love about the madman's output. Oh, and he created this god-awful thing. That's right. Savage Steve Holland created the goddamn whammy. So when you think, we gotta create some children's entertainment, but... EXTREME! Who else but Savage Steve Holland would you call on to create a cartoon for children? There is no other. And the cartoon he created ran for five years, had 75 episodes, and featured dark humor, violence, slapstick, black comedy, and the mean-spirited nihilism you just didn't get on Rescue Rangers. From a cartoon about a gentle, kind, helpful, naive cat, a cat named Eek. Today, we're looking at Eek the Cat for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And the source for this weird-ass game to determine if its courageous kitty has what it takes to get a license to play? We're gonna have to fire up the evaluation. Go ahead. 1992 and Steve Holland, along with Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister, throw together a shredder of a guitar track as a theme song and produced a cartoon called The Six and a Half Lives of Eek the Cat. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's about an unlucky pink cat named Eek who wants to be helpful but brings catastrophe in his wake and is always nearly killed in every episode. 
The show more or less followed Steve's original pitch. Kind, dim-witted, naive Eek is abused, assaulted, and finds himself in all kinds of harrowing situations as he doesn't understand that he's in danger, as he tries to help old ladies across the street and all other kinds of good deeds, bringing us to the theme of the show. No good deed goes unpunished. It premiered in 1992 as Eek the Cat. Thirteen episodes were produced, and all I needed to know was Savage Steve Holland was making a children's show. It was either going to be wholly inappropriate or subversive enough to be appealing to a grungy dirtbag high schooler like myself. And I was not disappointed. The credit sequence alone, watch this, shows off the masterful black comedy at the heart of the show. This cat is in frickin' trouble. We'll probably fail a lot, and we'll be put in insanely punishing situations. And it's fine, because Eek, honestly, is just a cartoon. The show wasn't hard to understand, and started out as a slapsticky satire of sickly, sweet, anthropomorphized animals, then moved on to satirizing movies, albeit in very surreal ways, and was a lot of fun. The show features Eek, whose voice sounds a lot like Splat, if you ask me. His girlfriend, Annabelle, voiced by sex tigress Tawny Katane, hello, a large lady cat who Eek just sees as a beautiful, big, more-to-love individual. His amour. There are subversive characters like Piggy the Penguin, who's based on the tragic child victim of murder from Lord of the Flies. And Mom is played by Eleanor Donahue, the 50s answer to Teenage Sweetheart. She was Ellie from uh, Andy Griffith. So, beautiful lady doing voices for this ridiculous show. And then... There's Shark Dog. I mean, come on. Rude Dog and the Dweebs? Eat shit. This is Shark Dog. He should have really had his own show. He's the epitome of tood, rude, and at turns soft-hearted and magical, but mostly an asshole. The show was a success, running for five years, and at the height of Eek's popularity, where he was king of the weird-ass cartoons, they decided to bring out a video game. Fox went out and hired longtime licensed game manufacturer and designer and, well, albatross around the neck of the Spectrum and Amiga owners in the mid-90s, Ocean, to develop the Eek the Cat game. Now, let's talk about this because we haven't really before. Amiga games are their own flavor, right? Ocean's Amiga games were yet another distinct flavor, and their licensed games were a third distinct, separate flavor. So, it was this company developing a game based on the wacky, dark, and nihilistic Eek the Cat in a time when they cut so many corners you'd think they were selling flat discs of compressed garbage. You know, like Kenny G or John Tesh Vinyl. Ocean would cut corners by, well, aping popular and bygone arcade games and slapping a license over them. They did this so many times since the original success of Robocop, which was basically a slap-together license swap of Green Beret, That Data East went and turned into a great arcade game, actually, and Ocean turned into a printing press for money. Navy Seals, Robocop, Commando, Rambo, Rambo 2. And then Rambo was basically just Commando from the arcades slapped onto Rambo. And it was same gameplay, easy to lift because they they did a port of Commando. So basically, making it just be Rambo was easy for them. I mean... I'm not saying they stole, but Bob's your uncle. There it is. Rambo is Commando. Look at it side by side. But then in the mid-90s, Ocean was taking games that were their original material that didn't sell very well, and then they would slap licenses over those. Red Heat reminded me of a thing like that, even though I think it was meant to be a Kung Fu clone, but with Army, and it's not very good. But they did slap a license on an original title, and that's the case with Eek. Eek the Cat is one of those games I grabbed because mainly, I love the license. And I was mystified to wonder what in the hell they would do with this thing. I mean, the the cartoon is so arch and sarcastic and sardonic and dark and mean. I mean, I wondered if it'd be like one of the Ren and Stimpy games, you know, kind of hit or miss. But let's think about it. I mean, instead, after I played it, well, let's take a look at the gameplay. (laughs) This is Sleepwalker, a charity case of a game, if ever there was one. No, oh wait, I'm not being mean that it's not bad or pathetic or anything. It literally is a game created for the comic relief charity to help the homeless. 
It's a charity case game. I suppose using this bare bones game as a skeleton for an eek game kind of makes sense since it's also about being kind and helpful. But what Ocean did is just literally slap graphics from Eek onto their basic-ass sleepwalker death prevention sim and create an animated intro of very high quality and called it an, a day. So they, they, there you go. There's your SNES game, dick. So I'll show these side-by-side side in parts because I might as well evaluate both. But Eek's game is just a clone of Sleepwalker. So let's strap in for a quick one, folks. Sleepwalker has five levels. They don't really correspond to anything but a generic, comedic, video game sense of danger for a sleepwalker in various situations where a dog has to go rescue them. However, Eek's five levels are based on legit episodes from the show. Uh, based, sort of. So long as it fits with sleepwalker's levels and the sprites aren't too different from the originals, yeah, I guess they're based on Eek episodes. Eek's five stages are ostensibly based on the cartoon's episodes from the manual. You can read that stage one is Misereek. After a nasty accident with a block of soap, Eek's friendly neighbor lady is convinced Eek the cat has rabies and has decided to take him to the vet. Eek has to steer her clear of all the animals in the zoo. I mean, outside the vets. She's not really sleepwalking in this. She's blind. So Eek helps the blind lady get to the vet so he can get shots. Stage 2, Eek versus the Flying Saucers. Annabelle is kidnapped to an alien city, and it's an escort mission. It's boring and it sucks. Stage 3, Hollow Eek. It takes place on Halloween in a graveyard. It's an escort mission. It's boring, and it also feasts upon ass. Because it sucks. Stage 4, Bears in the Hood. It is a city stage. It is an open sandbox battle royale mode, but wait, no. It is an escort mission, and it sucks ass casserole. Stage 5, It's a Wonderful Nine Lives. It's a Christmas-themed escort mission. It's boring, and it gave my eyes cancer of the dick. It slowly feasts upon the genitals of leprous zombies. It sucks. Look, folks, the manual is the beginning and end of the humor that you're going to find in this game in the show. And the quality of the show is only found in the sprite work and the opening intro scene, really. The control schematic is probably the most accurate depiction of how it feels to play this game. There you are. Each button does something. You're sure of it. But it seems like button presses are either suggestions your SNES doesn't take seriously or are physical representations of how robots have rap battles and you just said some serious shit about your SNES's mom. Which, of course, was the NES. SNES doesn't know who his daddy is. All the Genesis fans right now are saying it was the Genesis. Burn. But seriously, you got a jump button, a turn the victim around from the front button, and a kick in the ass button from behind. There's a swap places button while you're standing still, and a whack things with a fish button. Those are your buttons. This fucking game. Ooh, boy. You know, I'm glad we got to talk about one of my favorite cartoons growing up and spread the word about it. But the purpose of this show is to evaluate the game. And damn, I hate to say it, but the Sleepwalker original is the better game. I mean, Eek looks fine and all, but... The real deal is that this game was slapped together by a bunch of greedy, corner-cutting butt muffins who probably smell like too much brute and beer farts. And all have mustaches, which also smell like brute and beer farts. So only one question remains, thankfully. I mean, look at this game. And it's not, will this piece of trash fit in the anuses of the people responsible for making it? Of course, the question is, does Eek the Cat for the Super Nintendo have a license to play? No. No, 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 no. Um, here, look, it's like this. If I could give a license to play to a non-licensed game like Sleepwalker, Sleepwalker has a license to play. Because all of the things missing from Sleepwalker in Eek the Cat make Eek the Cat a lesser game. And also, it's not original. If there's one thing about Savage Steve Holland I hope that everyone has learned, number one, check out his movies. But number two... He was an original. He's an absolute original. He's gone on to greater success. Um, Fairly Odd Parents movie, a bunch of other things. The guy is doing great now for Nickelodeon and the Disney Channel. He makes kids entertainment that's slightly subversive, which is great. I'm glad he found the place he belongs, finally. But his game belongs on the shelf to be hidden from view until somebody goes, Oh, I remember Eek the Cat. 
you big liar, you don't. But hey, when you do say that to me, I'll gladly hand this game to you to put in the old Super Nintendo and have you try out what is unfortunately a game without a license to play. That being said, coming up next week, we begin a little jaunt into the history of a man who's beyond a man. A hero, if you will. A man who's both man and machine. He's both dude and where's my car? Pickles and jelly. You know, a perfect combination of strength and humor. I mean, you know, we're talking about the one and only. If you can guess it down below, I'll get you a no prize. How about that? Anyway, that's next week. And for now, let's just say that no matter what I said during this evaluation, what I said in the past, or we'll say in the future, remember to always, always, always stay retro and extreme. I'm kidding. Just stay retro. <laughs> Peace. Get upset on the internet. You're a salt adult. You're a salt adult. Get upset on the internet. You're a salt adult.